Like any self-respecting art movement, this podcast is a revolt against something that has come before it. There is at least one art podcast that I can think of that has come before this, and I happen to loathe it. So the basic structure for this podcast came very easily to me. Do the opposite of whatever that other podcast does. Seeing that we're currently revolting, and in the proper spirit of things, I'm going to say something that might shock you. I think that for many art collectors, the appreciation of art has more than a little to do with capital appreciation. Just like a venture capitalist investing in the next Microsoft, Uber, or Airbnb, what we're going to try to do here is to highlight potential investable artists before they're a big deal and out of reach. That being said, what we're trying to accomplish here is not to give advice on how to make a profit investing in art, or talk at length about the health of the art market, but rather to connect an audience of potential buyers with emerging artists in an intimate, meaningful way. The format is Guest artists choose five to ten works to discuss with the audience and share whatever, and as much as, they want to. With that, let me introduce you to Gabrielle Raff, our very first guest artist. She is more established than emerging these days, but seeing as it is the very first episode, I felt we needed a good dose of credibility to kickstart us and to show the next few potential guests we don't bite. For a comprehensive review of Gabby's artistic CV, visit the Smith Gallery website or gabriellerauf.com. Oh, and one more thing. If you're watching this on YouTube, everything's all good and you don't have to worry about a thing. But if you want to use your phone while lying on your back, then find The Art Investor on your podcast app and set it to playing in the background while you flick through the numbered pieces at your own pace on Insta. And with that, I bring you Gabrielle Raff. Cool. Um, so how, how's business now that coronavirus has hit, basically? Well, I was quite surprised. I was expecting a, a great tumbleweed rolling through the <laughs> dusty <laughs> through streets. Through the art market. <laughs> yeah. And for me, I think what, what happened was a, 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 quite an amazing um, uh, um, result of of years and years of networking and, and, and sort of hard work and definitely not having all my eggs in one basket, so not, not being represented by one gallery and having a, a, quite a healthy um, market or client base that I've established myself over the years. So for me, the moment lockdown was announced, my sales improved and I got <laughs> the most outrageous <laughs> amount of interest. So lots of commissions from from people I've never heard of before, uh, some from from old clients. One one was quite notable in that it was a, a South African client who'd bought a work for his wife ten years ago for her thirtieth birthday, and he got hold of me. He's now emigrated to Australia. Emailed me to say she's now turning forty and he wants to buy another work. And I thought that was an amazing, amazing connection. So why though? Why why now? I mean, well, I think that there is a very, a fairly logical link between people who can still, who still have enough cash around to spend on something like art, but because they're not spending it on travel and they're not spending uh, it on yeah. petrol and what all those other things they would have spent on and also they're spending more time at home so there's a the more time you spend at home and those little itchy corners yeah, that look ugly definitely. yeah all those you you have more time to remember that you really wanted to to do up a space and it needs needs a piece of mm. work um so that that has certainly um been had a good effect on my on my sales um how long it lasts we don't know but that's that's the nature of mm. of the business it's it's a ride um so what do you think about um you know individual you know representation like i mean you can uh, what, what do you think about is there a trend of artists going sort of solo representing themselves like doing all the social media things instagram's become a thing yes. like sort of yes. less less gallery representation i think so it it seems like that with the strengthening and the widening of social media, there's certainly uh, either way more artists than, uh, way more people out there making visual art than there were before, or otherwise, I think probably more likely we're just seeing them more. 
and but there's there's there 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 are way more people out there marketing themselves as um guides on how to market yourself online of course yeah i yeah. myself uh followed one or two of those uh, just out of for, for interest sake and and some of them are quite quite clever if, as long as you don't have to sign up for too too much newsletter yeah, stuff but and to be honest too much. you can spend six months and then call yourself an expert at that seo and all these things yeah like, yeah it's but really it's, it, it's, it has certainly given more people an opportunity to to get their work out there uh, it just means that there's way more stuff online to see and so that does that there's just way more noise way more visual noise mm. um so that, but, uh, yeah. so that's a sort of long-term cyclical trend versus now and, and accelerated now by COVID, right? Mm, mm. Um, because people can't go and view galleries. Galleries yeah. are going, oh, yeah. yeah, we can't pay for our space. You know what I mean? Yeah, kind of yeah. And, and I've certainly, um, I mean, I know of many, many artist friends who are using online platforms quite successfully. Uh, so I've got a friend who's set up like a weekly sort of online shop she's she's always wanted to to have a little shop of her own um and does she um list prices she does she does that's the next thing i want to ask you about how do you feel about artsy you know listing prices you know just i think i think for the buyer it must be quite quite a relief actually for, definitely i it can, must be because I, can, I i tend to just out of laziness say price on request yeah. on the website um and uh, I imagine it's a bit of a pain if you if you if you looking around a website. the the two The two issues I imagine as a buyer might be that you're looking around on a website and you can't tell properly what's available or not, and you can't see the prices. Uh, the, a, a lot of artists do that because they might like to change their prices depending on whether something's framed or not, or whether it's no longer represented by a gallery, and therefore uh, there can be a sort of artist studio discount that might be attached and also the vagueness sort of covers you mm. you, you don't have to commit mm. um i think that the it, it must be fairly it must as i said it must be a bit of a relief as a, a buyer to to see the price on on what you're interested in but i think the artist is also keen to make that connection so you th th what you really want is an email from somebody to say i saw your work on on your website and i'm interested in these sorts of things and that's where you can be, begin to where, you, where the personal a relationship can begin because that's where you can you can put in a small amount of information about the kind of work that they're interested in you might set the tone for where how that came about and that can help a client to it, to come a little bit closer. Yeah, but um, exactly. It increases sort of commitment on the buyer side. Absolutely. For me, I, um, I'm i looking at, on Artsy and I'm like, wow, I can actually afford this artist. Then mm. that's already, I'm like window shopping and now I want like yeah. to find the perfect one from that artist that I like. Yeah. But whereas before, it, if, if the prices aren't listed, I'm much more likely to go, well, okay. I probably can't afford it anyway. Yeah, so, and then, yeah, and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And an artist is, you know, it, Artists can be quite open to uh, clients making payments over over two two to three months, especially on on bigger sort of much pricier work. So that you're not going to list on your you're not going to say that on your website. <laughs> but that might be something depending on the on the client's personal situation and your situation. Mm. You know um, that that could, Lots of could work for both. Yeah, there's Those lots people. of financial in engineering going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, c could you take us um, through a bit of your history, like growing up in Cape Town? You know, early influences. You know, how that affected you. Mm. Um, your studies. You know. So I grew up in a family of uh, art art people, I suppose. My my parents met at art school in Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> but they both went on to, to more commercial art. My dad went in, into advertising. My mom went into uh, also sort of commercial art. And so we we always had art materials around. Art was very much a part of our every everyday life. Um, I did art at school, obviously. And, um, and then I went on to study fine art at Stellenbosch. 
And at the time, I'm not quite sure if they still offer it, but Stellenbosch offered a fine art degree, including a, an HDE, a, a higher diploma in education. And I chose to do that because I was always keen to teach in some capacity. So that was a combination of, of a fine art degree and doing your, your HD at the same time. I was at Stellenbosch for four years, and then I taught printmaking there for a year. And then my father, uh, Alan Raff, started the Red and Yellow School with his his colleague, Brian Soltrip. Oh, wow. And while I was teaching at Stellenbosch, he, he called me up and said, look, we, we need to offer these advertising design students some drawing lessons can you can you come and design a little course for us uh, which I did and I came to, and I and I taught there it was just part-time um, and I, I taught there for 18 years <laughs> <laughs> Wow! <laughs> um, 18 years and I had my daughter and then I went back and taught for another three years and it was fantastic because it was very much a fine art program I deliberately I mean, I mean, these were advertising design students, and I, they were they were doing life drawing, and they were doing printmaking, and very, very material, uh, uh, sort of material oriented work. Lots, lots to do with drawing, and in, and encouraging them to, to keep feeding their own creative skill set. So, it, so it was like, okay, let's just put put aside the money and the and the strap lines and the and the commercial aspect of art just leave for that a at, second yeah then, leave that at the door and let's let's awesome. experiment really with, nice, with, yeah. with the more fine arty stuff but obviously all along i've always had a studio and i've and i've always painted so right from from emerging from art school um i i used the gallery platform to to market my work so i've always been represented by by various galleries it's always seemed like a, a apart from yeah it's it's it, it to be represented by a gallery and to have your to to have your work shown in a gallery is sort of incomparable to anything online obviously when i was emerging it was the it was the early 90s where online didn't exist so you either exhibited or you or you you know you you kind of got forgotten um, so that that exposure was absolutely essential in terms of getting your name out there and and also that motivation for I've got a show coming up and and it's a solo show and I need to make oh, you know, well, yeah. a body of twenty to thirty yeah. works and they have to be good, which means that they've, they've got to be probably more like thirty mm. to forty works so that you can choose the best of them. But sort of even now, I mean, on this podcast, I was going to say. I only want signed artists, you know what I mean? I only want represented artists on mm. it. Because Instagram, the number of followers on Instagram doesn't always represent, you know, the art. I mean, <clears throat> just for instance, like really good looking women often have thousands of followers <laughs> and they have like 20 photographs of just them, yeah. you know, in Venice or something, you know? And that doesn't really, you know, <laughs> so it could be an artist, but just a really good looking one. And then you... you <laughs> <laughs> you look through their followers and it's just lo loads of guys, you know? Oh, amazing. And it's just um, not really representative of, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, so. Yeah, it's just representative of the human race. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, I, 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 I've sort of, I, 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 I resist judging online uh, representation too much at this point because we're we're about to exactly it's changing it's really now. exploding and it's changing radically where where in fact um i mean i think of someone like benele Corza, for instance who's an artist that was he was represented by smith for a little while and then he he was represented by zeitz he had some work on at zeitz mocha and he's now very much an online presence. He he runs his own gallery. He's he's his own. He represents other artists, and he's he's working in Johannesburg. And he he has very engaged engages with other artists. Has amazing little short you know short videos on Instagram. And and he has basically said, well, no thanks. I'm going to represent myself. So there is still an element of the of the traditional gallerist, but it's 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 an artist who's taken taken it 
over for himself. There's an empowerment in, 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 he's like, well, nobody can really represent me better than myself. Exactly. And I want to move in the directions that I feel suit me, as opposed to working within the constraints of, of a gallery. But I mean, artists opening up to like street art, everything is like, and you know, in a sort of climate of, you know, no one's allowed to judge anyone else. Mm. You know what I mean? In that sort mm. of very leftist climate that we're sort of going into and have been going into for a while. Yeah. It's opening up everything. It's no, no longer yeah. like, Hmm, I, I, I should like this because lots of other people like it. It's more like people, people are more empowered to just go, oh, I don't yeah. like it, whatever. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I think, you know, in, in in five years' time, we might be able to answer it, you know, mm, yeah. the online thing, you know, whether it's good or bad, or we might, might, might have better, better clarity on it, you know, but the yes. jury's still out in my yes. head. Yeah, yeah. And 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 if, yeah, I mean, it's it, it, there's this weird situation where you think there must be so many amazing people so much there's so much amazing stuff to see and to to listen to and to be exposed to and maybe i'm missing a whole lot yeah and you've got to keep on stepping away from that stuff and thinking jeez i wouldn't have half this cuck it, it's thrown good. at me <laughs> if i just turned my my phone off and 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 focused on um, focused on what I'm making and, and, and it actually makes one want to go back into the beautiful old libraries and pick up a, a huge big book on Rodin and or, 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 and contemporary artists but I, I long for for beautiful books that I can page through mm. um, which you certainly can't find at exclusives I mean the only place you can find decent art books now is, is the book lounge and um, uh, exclusives has has absolutely no art books left and wow. I, I don't I, I did quiz the lady the other day and she was like they just don't have the market for it and they don't have the funding and all the the buyers uh the pla the, the the sort of the platform forms on which they used to through which they used to purchase these art books that's all changed um in my case it's quite important to look at the work chronologically because as with most artists, the work that I make is very affected by where I'm at at that time. So that's both mentally and physically, yeah. where I might be living, yeah. where I've just traveled to. You often so I've hear been that. Quite, yeah, I've been quite uh, influenced by, by my travels. And so the first image which is uh, something that actually kick-started all of my work which relates to uh, looking at the things around me in my environment but from a very different perspective, from, from a bird's eye perspective. That came about on a trip to London. I went up on the London Eye and as I was, uh, as I was reaching the top I looked down and there was a two circles of school children sitting down on, on the ground with their sort of teachers standing around them. And I looked down and took a few shots. And that was the first time that I, I made use of that quite extreme perspective of looking down on stuff. And as a result of that perspective, you lose a lot of detail. So what you're looking at in terms of the figurative form is... Uh, there's far less detail than you would than you would see something close up, and obviously you're looking down. Things are flattened, and the perspective is quite strange. And I, I, when I went, when I came back home, I made a painting of of that scene. But that that also affected uh, the the rest of my. What came later was a was a whole uh, um, sort of expose into looking at other things from from above. And um, I went to Japan in 2008, and that was also amazing, going up uh, skyscrapers and looking down on people and then looking down on buildings. And then also what's quite important is to note that just prior to that visit to London, which was in about 2006 or seven, I, I was just recovering from a really bad illness, from, from an autoimmune disease. And for about six months to a year, I couldn't work at all. And um, just before getting ill, I was 
I was like complete A type personality doing about five different jobs, uh, designing lights and teaching and and painting and doing paint effects and murals, etc. And and the the illness just stopped me in my tracks. I couldn't physically paint. Uh, I, I was always an oil painter, working with oils, working with all all the fume based paints. Fume based. Yeah. So so spirit <laughs> spirit based yeah, yeah. paints. So terps and uh, even if it's genuine terps, it just it seemed to t- to trigger this this illness. Um, so I couldn't work with that at all. I was very fragile, very frail physically. And as I emerged from this illness and started to get well. One of the first things that I did, almost as a meditative uh, process of getting back into my body, was to paint in watercolor and make these small paintings. I was living in Johannesburg at the time, and I started making these small, delicate paintings of the of the Joburg skyline, and and also looking down on 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 neighborhoods and on the city itself. And so that was a mass that have a, had a massive effect on on the way that I worked because that's all about materiality. So moving from very large scale oil paintings to these small, delicate, very intimate works, which I could I could work on it for for five to ten minutes at a time, and then I'd have to go and sleep, um, wow. or like sleep, feed myself, wow. rest. Because painting is very much a physical act, mm. um, it requires you to to be in in your body, in 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 the space that you're working in, in your in your limbs, and and right down to your fingertips. Energy, you know, you need that energy. Absolutely, you need that energy. But it also is a is an opportunity to get out of your head, which is a place that can be quite frustrating to live in, especially if you're not well. Yeah. Um, so you can, you can dwell on, on the, on the negative. Mm. Um, and so it's, it, it, it really looking back on it now, it really was my first experience of meditation. And, uh, so, so the watercolor was, it was a total game changer for a, me. A break from what you've done before. Yes, absolutely. And, and what the illness also did was because I couldn't go back to, I didn't go back to teaching for quite a while. I couldn't go back to climbing up ladders and painting people's ceilings and walls. I stopped making lights. I stopped doing all the, all those other jobs that I was doing to try and make money and to sort of, in, in in a way, they were also distractions, mm-hmm. and I purely uh, went became a painter again, which is which is what I really should have been doing all along. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so the practice became much more focused, um, much more uh, much more one one dimensional. Um, and as everyone knows, when you when you focus on something, that's when it starts to develop definitely um you know uh warren buffett and bill gates uh, this is what i know Mm. um these are people i know um they both said um separately they said the greatest thing that contributed to their success the greatest factor was focus Mm. Mm. yeah and and turning up so so that was a big lesson i mean you can tell that to any artist as a as a as an artist who's been been painting for 25 years and it took me at least half of that time to properly uh, remember that you've got to turn up at your studio or even your desk or wherever it is your stuff is. And you might not know what it is you want to make, but you've got to be there. Make something. You, you have know? to be there. Um, even if you don't make anything, if you, if, you, if you don't turn up at that space, nothing can really happen. So the, the whole uh, problem with distraction and prescri- pro- procrastination is is a uh, is the bane of of, of any, mm. especially a creative person. I mean, writers possibly even even more difficult. We we have to turn up at this blank page. But routine, um, you know, people think of exactly. artists as just creativity, pure yes, natural creativity. Yes, and that it just comes to you. It doesn't. You have to work at it just as. So hard. you know, um, one of the questions I ask, you know, um, is um, sort of like. Re- 
natural creativity or relentlessness? Or what's the blend between oh, those two? A combination. So what, is it 60-40? Or? Uh, I'm not prepared to, <laughs> <laughs> to use numbers. Because <laughs> You can take your numbers. <laughs> because uh, an, an anecdote I always tell is um, Bob Dylan, you know, people... Yeah. They know sort of like th- like three to six songs of his, and those were the main hits. But mm-hmm. if you download his disco- discography, there's like 150 songs, yes. and most of them aren't that great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he made he he pitched up like he yeah. made the stuff he made, yeah. and and six out of 150 were amazing, world changing songs. Yes, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, and interesting, you use him as an example. Picasso is an example, a Bob Dylan type example, where where creativity comes in 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 two different forms and they don't necessarily uh they don't necessarily live just in one person one artist can hold both of those use both of those creative forces at different times in their life and the one is so the bob dylan picasso idea is that the, the idea came very quickly to them uh, the 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 song uh sort of many of bob dylan's songs he, he spoke about them literally in an afternoon or an hour he might have mm. written it and the music was there the same with picasso is extremely prolific in his lifetime and he, and he he manifested many incredible works in in a short space of time um and then you look at someone like like um leonard cohen who took 15 years to write and rewrite yeah. hallelujah until he was finally but happy that, that song is the is perfect like there's nothing like, yeah but it wasn't all along for him he was not yeah, he yeah, was yeah. not happy so so to come back to your your comment about it's not it's not about divine intervention creativity is partly relentlessness partly a spark i mean you, you have to want to do it you have to be drawn determination to rather. do it yeah determination and and part of that is a is a skill um quite a bit of it is luck and chance maybe you're at the right place in the right place at the right time uh or you happen to have the means to to pursue more relentlessly your career than someone who has to keep on uh doing other stuff to 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 make money mm. um and, and therefore they get s- sort of distracted. Um, and then a huge amount of it is just relentless turning up and, and dedication. And, exactly, yeah. yeah. Even in something completely unrelated like, you know, um, finance. <laughs> yeah. I find that, um, you know, if, I'm just, if I just pitch up, you know, for the first 10 minutes, I'm really hating what I'm doing. But then it's almost like fishing. Like suddenly you catch a wind of energy and suddenly mm. you're in it. And mm. if you had done something else that day... Yeah. Then you you wouldn't yeah. have caught that yeah, wind yeah. of determination, yeah. you know. Yeah. But then other times you sit there and you hate it f- yeah. for like two hours. You're like, yeah, Phew. yeah. What's interesting is um, so prior to I now I have a studio at home, um, but for m- my entire career I I had some amazing studio spaces sharing with other artists. That must have been ni- quite quite cool though, actually. W- wonderful, yeah. And and my space in in observatory, which. Th- uh, four of us owned um we, we we worked there for 20 years and so there was an amazing obviously uh sharing of our, of ideas and support that's quite an important part of coming to a space where other people are doing the same thing with the same intensity and it gives it credibility Definitely. and and it gives you aff- affirmation that you, you it's okay that you that you're coming to work and your work is sloshing around with with paint and but, color. But for me, it's like I hate it when I'm when 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 my friend leaves the office later than I do. Well, when I leave before he leaves, you know. <laughs> so it always um, pushes me to stay longer, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. One is one is, and that's part of the trigger thing that uh, and forming good good habits. I was just listening to an amazing podcast podcast yesterday about how to how to form good habits and part of it is is uh, setting up situations that make it favorable for you to take on better behavior behavior that that allows you to 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 do what you want to do so so for your your intentions to be to be manifest it really helps to have people around you who have similar uh, goals similar ideas and uh, where, where there's a similar wavelength. So, so very vigorous discussions about work, 
one's own work and that incredibly valuable concept of having having another artist around to give you um, sort of the thumbs up that yes that work is finished or no you're not quite there because <laughs> uh, it's quite a lonely place to be Definitely. to sometimes make those decisions yeah. and sometimes you can you can really doubt whether you whether what you have made is is finished and so often I have made work like some of the best work I've made has happened in hours or two days, like big works. And it just, it just comes out and then you think you, you'd be very pleased and sort of chuffed with yourself. And then the self doubt immediately kicks and you think, now how can that can't possibly be finished? It only took me two hours. And that is just pure experience and confidence in oneself, mm. like sense of self mm. where you can say, no, that's, take it or leave it that's it um, but working in a space with other people does can help with that okay so we we're talking a bit about a series of works i made in 2007 for the first spear contemporary art competition and and the work was selected uh unanimously for for that show uh the the series of works are called dislocation and they're four Bird's eye view, actually they are Google Earth viewpoints looking down at four distinctly different neighborhoods in South Africa. And so the one is Joe Slovo, there's Mitchell's Plain, Bishop's Court and Grassy Park. And what influenced this work was that at the, at the time I was, I was teaching and I remember thinking that there were a couple of students who lived in these areas, Mitchell's Plain, Grassy Park, and had quite a long and winding route to school each day. And I, I had just experienced about three sort of hectic sort of personal security issues like within a space of six months. So I, I was held up at gunpoint in my car. I had my car stolen and I was shot in an art shop where I got a bullet in my car. <laughs> the top oh of yes, my yeah, eye. I remember. Um, the, the piece of shrapnel. So wow. I was extremely freaked out about uh, moving around in, in Cape Town. <laughs> uh, if, if, if any international people are listening, um, we, we us South Africans don't get shot on a regular basis. <laughs> no, it was absurd to be to be shot in an art shop, and and I was thinking, I, I, it's it's so crazy that I can't. I would love to be able to go and visit a student of mine at Grassy Park and go and see where they live. And, and, and it was so, it was so r sort of crazy to me that I felt personally, it was like unsafe to do that, that I would, I would need some kind of police escort to go into <laughs> to Joe Slover or whatever. And I also have friends who live in Bishop's Court. And at the time, uh, so this is 2007, Google Earth had only just come out. It was quite a new platform. And I, I just had this sort of brainwave that I, I could visit, I could see where they lived by using the, by using Google Earth. So mm -hmm. they, with their permission, they gave me their actual addresses and I looked them up and I took those Google Earth references and I made these very, very simple, very delicate watercolor paintings of the immediate area of, of their address. So there's no, deliberately, no people, no roads, no cars, no, no context other than rooftop. And what emerged were these rather beautiful patterns. And what they are really are, are little maps of, of that particular area. And because you're looking down on, t on, a, on a landscape and on rooftop, what you immediately get is a, is a, is a distinct sense of the difference between where people live in South Africa. So I obviously you know, deliberately chose a really sort of well-off area and a sort of middle-class area and then quite poor areas where people live very, very closely together. The housing density is yeah, much exactly. less. So, so what was revealed the by, by the rooftops was, was very much around how people live in South Africa and, and the inequality. And, uh, and then that led on sort of, I, I was, I was very, very interested in that kind of work. And, and a bit later I made a work called neighbor neighbors, which was 
a blending of of Bishop's Court and a sort of sl- Joe Slovo area together. This is image five. The, yeah. So so this was sort of a, a kind of a more playful look at land distribution. It was like because if you look down at at your average property in Bishop's Court, there's there's so much space around each house. So, and this is Bishop's Court here. Yeah. So so the so the bigger rooftop. Buildings are, are the of the are the buildings in of homes in Bishop's Court, and then all the tiny little rooftops are are, are your typical shack areas in a place like Joe Slovo, um, and that work was bought by by UCT, um, and is currently in their environmental sciences um, and so, geography building. I, so I I would have never seen it because <laughs> I had never gone in there before. No. <laughs> No, that was any finance. <laughs> yeah, it moved around a bit. Um, yeah, and and so what's quite interesting about about this work? There was for quite a, a a long period in my life, work that I was making that was very removed from the person in the street or from from my from people I, I encountered. It was it was I was looking from far away, and I think. In retrospect, it had quite a quite a bit to do with my own my own sort of being out of my body for so long through through my illness, and then this w- sort of quite weird experience of of feeling unsafe in in my own neighborhood and in in the place where I worked, and and then slowly I there's a point at which you instinct you instinctively know your material has to change because you know fe- you, you no longer feel like working with this material. Uh, it's, it's not, not pushing you. It's not pushing you. It's not thrilling you. So I think just one day I was like, no, I, I, I've got to have more paint. I need something that's more visceral, more intuitive because th- those watercolor works are based on photographic reference and it's it's sort of more planned although there's no drawing on the paper first i stretch these large boards and i'll i'll have the image in front of me and i deliberately only select certain aspects of what i can see um so i'm placing down on the page what the viewer can see is only a, only certain chosen aspects uh, so that there's initially a little bit of confusion as to what you're looking at and and that is deliberate i've Mm. always enjoyed the idea of confusing the viewer Uh, it's not a stencil it's a bit of a game you know like what what am i looking at you've got to just stand there a little bit longer before the 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 penny drops um and i i had this sort of longing to make work that i i did not know what it was going to look like at the end so these watercolor works i had a sense of what piece of the puzzle was going to come next and it was it was almost like a game of of uh, like putting puzzle pieces together and what i longed to do was something was to work in a way that i was more familiar with at university and and the way i worked before i i got ill which was working with materials that um have have a way of of uh, sort of interacting with one another to, that, where you don't have control, and um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't go back to working with oils. So I, I discovered water-based oils, uh, which which sounds like a complete contradiction in itself, and they work in a very similar way. Uh, they smell like oil paint, so there's this wonderful sort of emotional, nostalgic. Uh, trip uh, yeah. that you go on but I, I enjoy diluting my materials quite a bit so I still work with watercolor, I work with water based oil and with ink um, but my next my next sort of exploration was was to return to a place of uh, a, a place of more chaos chaos of mystery of uncertainty um, and that for me that is the you know place of working where I'm currently at. Um, I really do jump quite happily between the two worlds of of watercolor on paper, quite sort of serene, simple, edited um, pools of paint um, in the, in the figurative work that I make and the sort of rooftop work. These sort of almost urban, c- c- cerebral. 
Yes, yeah, yeah. sort of cerebral, uh, but where, where I know what's coming and I sort of know how it's going to land up and it's much more precise. Mm-hmm. Uh, to a, a world, a, a way of working where, where you really have no idea what it's, what the outcome is going to be, and I find that place the most invigorating. Okay, so the next work is called Potential, and it was part of a body of work that I made for a solo show at Salon Ninety One in two thousand and fifteen. This is um, Image Six. Image Six. And what's interesting about it uh, on many levels, so it was very much, it was the beginning of working with, with a sort of quite a new, a new medium. So I'd never worked with water-based oil before, but it was a departure from the very clean and simple watercolor work. And I decided to, to try and make use of all sorts of substrates that I already had in the studio. So bits of board and s- sort of, so this particular work was a, was a little, a little canvas, but it was Belgian linen that I'd found from some secondhand shop. And so it had no, no art. It had no painting on it. It was this, was this plain little canvas and it was primed white and I, I didn't like the white I liked the, the raw Belgian linen so I ripped the thing off well I carefully took it off and then I used the same little little tacks and I turned the Belgian linen over I reversed it and retacked it to the the frame and so there are these little edges that stuck out and I, I think what I was trying to do was to try to deliberately be as unprecious as possible because the watercolor stuff was so precious, mm. so like beautiful, clean, white, beautifully, exactly, yeah. perfectly stretched Fabriano. And I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. Uh, so it can tend to to sort of limit one when, you, when you're too careful about being perfect. So I, every, every step of the way, I was deliberately trying to be to, to invite chaos and to invite sort of um, intuition and invite the emotion back into the work because that for me what was um, is what I was feeling sort of as a as a maker of things and a creator of of imagery was what what, what I was really sort of hankering after but then I'd done this little trick of turning it over and I was like, well, what the hell must I put on it now? And I, without giving too much away, I just looked at what was sitting on my surface, like this messy, typical artist studio surface of, of sort of tape, a roll of tape, and there was some pens and some brushes and oil, oils lying around. And I, I made this, I just made this drawing of a, of a roll of tape, like packaging tape that was sitting on the table and I did this simple little drawing and then I sort of I kind of went through a process of almost editing it of almost destroying it by by uh, taking a piece of card and some some paint and just plastering it over the top and so that sort of act each act of putting down paint and also taking something as simple as just an object on my desk that didn't have any intellectual at the time felt like it had no intellectual value it wasn't cognitively it wasn't terribly interesting or academic it was just purely a glancing at the first thing I saw and I put it down and I decided to frame that in a almost like as an artifact and it was a bit of a breakthrough work because it felt like a sort of a you know Pulling, pulling the middle finger at myself and at the whole idea of, of how, how one is allowed to uh, s- sort of the academic way of approaching making art. Exactly. When I first looked at it, I thought, is that finished, you know, or w- mm. what is that? And then I thought, okay, now I get it. Like, wow, that looks like a 3D. To me, it, it doesn't look like a roll of tape. It looks like a pot, like a 3D urn. Exactly. You know? and, and of course, what one immediately then in, in retrospect is that you remember that the the universal shape of the circle of the beginning of and, and the end point and that there's so many different things that you can now attribute it to like this the the, the that beautiful Japanese Enso meditate, meditative mark where you in a single 
in breath and out breath, you, you begin and finish a circle with one brush stroke. Um, it's a, it's a, a beautiful traditional um, sort of meditative painting method that, that um, Japanese artists use. Of course, I had no idea. I, I didn't. Uh, I think the important thing is, is that none of it was in intentional in in terms of oh this is the kind of picture I want to make what does this picture say about me it was it was calling on an intuitive mark making that it was it was a sort of like help me out here come from somewhere and because I was there at the very beginning of the process of of knowing I needed to I was embarking on the process of making a whole series of works and I had the time I wasn't under pressure and it wasn't like a commission it was just okay here's the time here's this the materials just make stuff and so that's how the 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 work that that then followed it was the tone was set by this one single piece called potential which is why I called it potential because it felt like yeah, it really yeah. here here here's the potential for all the others. Cool. So the the next work is it? Um, piece number seven or image number seven. Okay, so this work was called I uh, called Paradise. It's from the same solo show. And it is quite important to note, as I was saying earlier, that that the work that I make is very much influenced by my state of mind, my state of being at the time. Um, so my my partner and I were were busy. Uh, our, our sort of marriage, our relationship was busy falling apart and disentangling. And we had a child, and we were both still living in the same property, and the home that we were living in was kind of a paradise, I suppose, a, a, this beautiful space, um, very privileged space, beautiful garden. And I I found myself in, in my sort of emotional turmoil that, that I was going through. I, I, would, I would wake up at about two o'clock every morning in the early hours of the morning and I couldn't get back to sleep. And on a few occasions, it, it, there was a full moon, and I decided to go outside because there is these incredible shadows and light that the, that the moon was casting on the garden. And I have a, a great little um, Canon G15, which is able to capture pretty much anything. Even the moon. Even yeah. Well, the, the light in the garden. It just, it was you know you you, you change your shutter speed oh, and all okay. that sort of stuff. So so manual settings. And I was able to take these incredible reference shots of the garden um, and this very space that was meant to be my refuge and my paradise and, and a safe space was was uh, sort of teetering. Uh, it, it, it was very emotionally charged because the house, we, we were going to need to sell the house and this, this very thing that represents uh, stability and, and sort of the, the the thing that you work towards the, the uh, thing that you come home to uh, away from your problems exactly yeah your your refuge was 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 the very thing that was staring at me in the face and, and presenting all my sort of uh, failures and and um and and was was not not a happy place and i suppose and i sort of turned turned the that emotional stuff into um, it fed into the work, definitely. And the show was called Night Watch. And I, so almost all the imagery was uh, that, that referenced the paintings were either referen a, a photographic reference that I took myself and some, some imagery from my, my childhood, um, sort of found imagery from my childhood. And that, that began another, another sort of process of, of working that I'm still working with currently, and that is the idea of, of being interested in photography itself and how a photograph can fix an image. Um, and that artists that work with photography, uh, and there are many of them that, that I admire, um, 
there's firstly this acknowledgement that you are working from a photograph, but secondly, that the photograph is merely a, a, a sort of a, um, it's kickstarting the process. So I, I'm completely not interested in painting a picture of the photograph. The photograph presents a moment in time that the camera has been able to, to fix. And from there, the, the mind and the sort of um, one's emotions uh, begin, begin the unraveling of a new story and, and, and a sort of new imagery is, in, is sort of ensues, mm. uh, follows that. Um, so it, it's, um, and, I, and that is kind of the, the, the work that I'm making currently is also very, very much uh, the, the beginning, the very, very first spark is, is from photography that photographs that I found in newspapers. So often it's sort of very everyday sort of quotidian imagery that, that applies to almost everyone. So there's a kind of a universality in, 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 in the images that I tend to work from. Um, but the process is very much one of, of intuitive layering of paint. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. You layer your own um, idea, uh, ideas and emotions onto the... Yeah. And, and I think that there's always this idea of, of that the, the history of the mark making is visible. So that's what happens with the kind of paint that I work with is when it dries, it doesn't obliterate what's underneath it. It doesn't cover it up. Um, if you're working with acrylic, uh, you, you tend to, to cover up. Mm. Um, it's just the nature of the paint. It covers up what's underneath. Whereas I'm, I love the idea of, of, of the, what came before is still visible right at the end. Um, so it, it, it sort of, it does speak to the idea of, of uh, that we are the sum of, of all our experiences rather than a final product yeah and yeah. that uh, that there's no point in denying all the the foibles and the and the failures those are those are aspects of what oh, oh. Of what have made you know what has made you who you are and, and all the first drafts and the second the drafts. First drafts yeah yeah you can't you can't sort of erase them they're yeah. there so i play with that quite a bit in in my work and this so uh, this work this very very pink work um, is actually in my garden, looking up at the mountainside, and some of the 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 houses that sort of look look in on me. And there's the process of of some of the some of the processes of working with watercolor on paper. So the the sort of traditional way of working with watercolor on paper is that what you want to be white, you must leave the white of the paper. And in this case, it's the white of the canvas because you can never ever get crisp white again um, and it's totally different if you try and apply it afterwards mm -hmm. so the sort of I think the sort of physical the, the the visual power of this image is that you have all the sort of swirly washy pink and some some uh, reference to trees and to garden but that strange slightly eerie white house that's looking in on you is 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 that's that's kind of quite important in that work that 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 was left the white of the canvas. Okay. So there's a kind of a horrific. The pink is almost horrific rather yeah, than yeah. romantic. Yeah. Wow. Talking about it really adds another light. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It does help. Okay. It's all about my relationships. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We, we, we've got that, but we'll cut it out. <laughs> no, never mind. <laughs> I don't mind. There's no point in hiding the stuff. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so, yeah, just having a bit of a laugh about about the nature of 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 the next body of work um, comes from a solo show that I had with Smith in 2017. It was called the show is called Trail, and these works are all very large scale uh, ink and watercolor on paper. And they look at um, my almost daily or at least weekly walks in the Constantia Greenbelt, which is why I called it Trail. It was sort of following a very particular path through, through this luscious forest scenes. 
and um, so by this stage, my my ex partner and I have separated, and and we have we have dual custody of of our daughter, and so we meet sort of almost on a weekly basis, uh, the three of us, and have a walk through the forest. Like I, I might be be. Um, bringing Ren over to him for for his weekend, or or going to fetch her, and then we would land up having having these walks, and they were quite uh, they were quite healing walks, I think, for, for as a family that's now dislocated, um, both healing for her and for me. But it was quite obvious to me not only this this incredible beauty of this of this landscape and walking through it and in it, um, and just being affected by the sheer mass of nature and beauty um there was always this little this little element of of the the privilege of the area that that it was that was was very notable to me and and that we would we would also discuss and I, I would sort of just think about that the area that I was wandering through the area which is now the Constantia Greenbelt was um, was an area that many co- colored families lived in, in in the in the the 50s and 60s and 70s and that were moved moved out of during the, the group areas act and so although it's not sort of overtly uh, visible tangible in the work um, I, I, I have a sort of a nod to this idea in the titles and I was sort of thinking very much about this as I made the work. So the work is not just about trying to capture the beauty of the landscape, but there's a sort of an eeriness, a darkness, an underlying darkness in, in each of these large uh, um, watercolor pieces. This is now image eight. Image eight and it's called Degrees of Separation and it's really just these sort of monumental trees um but there's 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 a shadow there's a there's a shadow that lurks uh, sort of with within this sort of beautiful scene as well and just just as a point of interest in terms of of, of the actual execution of the work these are large large scale um work sort of over two meters two meters by sort of one and a half meters massive so I have a massive roll of Fabriano that I that I would roll out and have to wet and stretch with gum tape, and it's it's layers like hundreds of layers of ink, very starting very very lightly, uh, and and the distinct the difference here in terms of a body of work was was that I would wet the paper first, so the paper gets sort of wet just with a brush. I'll wet the area gently and then work into it so that's why it took so long because you touch the paper with with your brush that's loaded with a very diluted ink or watercolor and it just sort of spreads mm. then you have to wait for that to dry and then do another land another land so so the areas that are darker um are are just many more layers or sort of finally sort of culminating in in, in a in more strength of material um yeah, so that w- was a series of works de- dealing with sort of that particular area in nature. And what's quite notable as well is now how distinctly different uh, sort of my my personal sort of physicality with the work. So not only is the, is the actual physicality of the making of the work different, it's much more, um, it's much bigger, so quite, quite sort of... Um, Practically speaking, I have to really. I worked with these much bigger brushes, almost like 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 big household brushes. Oh. I would be working on the floor, sort of like doing yoga positions to try and reach the corners, um, and also so much more physically involved, bigger strokes. Um, but also, it's now on the ground, so so it's quite interesting the the difference here. Um, in fact, Virginia McKenney, who's a, who's a wonderful um, teacher at Michaelis, academic and painter herself, and she she was the the person who she was one of the judges at the Spear Spear Contemporary, and she um, was part of the acquisition of the neighbor's work, and she noted how my my work started to change from the Google Earth imagery, where I'm far away, there's this distance between the artist and the work. And the very very preciseness of it, and when I had this show trail, she was saying it's like the 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 vitality of 
there's a vitality that's that's returned, a different kind of physicality that's returned, and the artist has now settled on the ground again, is actually moving through oh, wow, yeah. through nature and is moving on the ground, and 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 you can kind of palpably sort of feel that and, yeah, and see yeah. that. I thought that was quite a an interesting remark. Okay, so um, Gabby has elected to do the medium fire round of questions and the uh, rapid fire no think yes or no round. So let's start with the medium fire round. Um, is there something you would advise emerging artists to cultivate early? Just find a space and a way of of making your own work as much as possible. Um, not to pander to things. Yeah, not to pander, uh, not to... I, I don't know. It, it's as simple as just do the work. Just mm. just turn up and do the work. Yeah, turn up, yeah. <laughs> um, who's your favorite artist and why? Yeah. Um, oh, it's so, it's so typical of, of, of real painterly painters. It's, it has to be Marlene Dumas. Uh, just a real painter's painter. Uh, uh, not afraid of tackling very hard, hard sort of very personal uh, subject matter and but just the way she she manages to wield that brush and the color is is magnificent um what's the first good art book that comes to mind it can be art history it can be anything um i think it for one of my most memorable is a is a is, a, is a, a book we got at school actually, which was the modern art book. I think everyone knows it with the big square painting on the front. Um, I don't. I can't even remember what it's called. History of modern art. I think it was. <laughs> I think I might have that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, natural creativity or determination, or what's the um, if you can't choose which one, what's the percentage split? I would say it's 50-50. In fact, it might even be 60-40, 60 for determination. Wow, yeah. yeah. What's the best piece of advice about being an artist you've received? My, my painting lecturer at university, I asked him, uh, uh, Timo Smuts was his name, I said, what, what's the, what is the, uh, what should an artist uh, do? What's their sort of function? Um, what should their aim be? And he said, part of their aim is to confuse the viewer. And I found that quite confusing at the time. Yeah. It's really stuck with me because it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, anarchic and, and well, revolutionary. It said, well, why would you want to confuse people? And to, in a way of, to I've, develop their thoughts. Yeah. That's why. And, and to hold them. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's what good, you know, fiction book, I mean, I mean, should do as well. Yeah. Um, if you weren't involved in art, what would you be doing? Music. I would be singing. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, if anyone's keeping score, I have a music degree, <laughs> which is a monumental waste of time if you want to go into finance, but you know. <laughs> oh, um, it's not, surely. <laughs> um, what do you think the most telling signs are for the future success of an emerging artist? That they they, they 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 have a uniqueness. So there's a very tangible uniqueness to what to what they're making. Something they can develop. Yeah, yeah, but something, almost something you haven't seen before, um, and and it, it just a strong sense of self, regardless of of whether that actually sits well in the industry or for them. There's a, there's a sort of a, a, a discomfort, and you can kind of see it in the work. So so it can be. Prickly. There's something sort of prickly about who they are and what they make. Yeah, something that's sort of immutable. That and and their time might come. You know what I mean? Their time. Exactly. Yeah. There, there's a, raw, a rawness. Society will come round to. Yeah. What they're doing. Absolutely. If you could have any three artists, dead or alive, over for dinner, who would they be? Peter Doig, Marlene Dumas, and R. B. Kitai. Okay, so now this is a, a rapid-fire round of no-think, yes-or-no questions. There'll be a million people on Mars before we die. No. Work-life balance? 
I, I, that's not a yes or no question. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, the earth is definitely flat. <laughs> no. <laughs> One day people won't age past their prime. I No. People should give up shaking hands forever. No. Art critics are a valuable and crucial net benefit to society. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for listening. It goes without saying, but for those who are not yet fully podcast literate, if you subscribe on your podcast app, you'll be notified about any future episodes.